Welcome to Communion and Shalom. In this podcast, we are exploring how the biblical and historic Christian faith can engage sexuality, ethnicity, culture, and our local communities as we pursue the flourishing of God's kingdom. Our goal is to engage these topics charitably and with nuance. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Communion and Shalom. This is TJ. And this is David. And today is a sort of a reflection episode. We want to talk about the the various side A guests that we have had in the past, I guess the past year or so, right? More or less, maybe past yeah, six months. Something like that. But something like that. And this includes my friend JP, who is a former side B person who went side A and now kind of sits in the agnostic space, sort of there. And then our friend Giacomo, who is side A, side A Orthodox man. And also our friend and David Frank's kind of neighbor, Tyler Sitt, who we might call side double A, who is side A in that he affirms that same-sex sex can be blessed by God or could be good. But he goes further where he doesn't just restrict, he doesn't say sex should only happen in marriage necessarily. Though I, I should say that I don't know if we ever actually got to talk about that in uh, our discussion with him. Um, we no. really still made it onto the podcast. And so maybe what will come out of this episode as well is some questions for for future conversations that we would be interested in having right. to hear some things fleshed out more. Definitely. So I actually think I was happy to see that as we approach planning this reflection time, we've actually seen a, we were representatives of different parts of what we might call broadly side A, right? We had the JP, formerly side B. We had the Tyler Sit, who I think was never precisely side B, but, you know, now side double A. And then we have Giacomo, who is now side A. So we have we have data points from all the, all the kind of different parts of their, their spectrum of side A, which I think is a good thing to have at this point. So we're going to focus on the question, what did we learn from our interviews so far with side A people? And the second question, what similarities and differences do we see with their perspective and our perspective from our conversations? Of course, some of these differences and similarities came up in the episodes that we recorded previously, but I think it this is more of a summative evaluation or summative reflection. And for any listeners, I might recommend that you go back and listen to the episodes to fully understand what we're saying. But in this episode, we will also share particular audio quotes that we've selected, and you'll be able to hear what the interviewee that we talked with said. And from there, we'll kind of reflect and share what we're thinking about as of now. I will say in my background in this conversation, my perspective as a side B person has developed over time, of course, as I think most of our perspectives mm -hmm. have, but I'm more sympathetic to side than I was maybe a year ago or something. But I'm not, I'm still, I still see pretty clear differences. And I, I sometimes wonder are the best way to relate to side A people with the clear differences that I see as important and the stakes being high. So there's tension for me, though, I mean, I see myself as pretty in the firmly side B, but I see myself as the middle and I probably would lean closer to side A than side Y <laughs> if we were thinking about the spec on the spectrum. So I just, that's my positionality in the conversation. So you'll probably hear me agree with much of what they said, or you'll hear some of the, the tension I have in wrestling with some a few of their points, even if I still disagree on the central argument, the, some of the central points that we disagree on. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on your position, David Frank? I'll probably have more thoughts by the end of our discussion on just kind of how these things, yeah, how these th things have influenced my thinking and, and where that kind of leaves me. I have a real care for the church at large. And so I'm really glad that we had these conversations and, and get to, mm. because I think there's a real harm when we are just closed off to our brothers and sisters who we might even see, you know, as, as holding heretical beliefs, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, or people might see our beliefs as being deeply immoral and oppressive. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that, you know, if there's, Christian charity in operation, you know, and not just pure vitriol, mm -hmm. that we would be able to 
beg from God that the Holy Spirit would be able to help us, you know, do that iron sharpening iron conversation and that we would be able to get to unity as time goes on. But I don't think that unity is going to happen if we just throw off the other Christians as fake Christians because they don't agree with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that too. I'm curious though, how do you put the categories of like heretical Christian versus fake Christian? Do you see them as separate, related? Because I assume you would not see Tyler Sitt and Giacomo and maybe JP, but he's agnostic kind of, but I assume you're not seeing them as fake Christians, though I assume you might consider them heterodox in a weak way, at least, if it may be heretical. I don't know if you use those terms. but I mean, I, Yeah, I didn't yeah. use the word fake Christian at all. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd probably only use that if someone was more nominal of yeah. where they like kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a, you know, born again, because that's more so just like, cultural thing that they kind of throw on but it's not really something that they're pursuing for folks who are earnestly trying to you know change their life and this world in light of who jesus is Mm -hmm. i would i would not be at all quick to throw that around and and say oh they're fake (laughs) yeah i get that like i'm i'm sure there's ways that i you know misuse what i think to be jesus's ways when it's really just my like pet peeves with my neighbors or automobiles or something <laughs> like, and sure. you know, I could pull the Jesus card to vindicate, you know, my convictions with out thoroughly interrogating it. Mm-hmm. And that's what we need each other for is to help interrogate and say, Oh, what of this is actually stemming from who Christ is and the gospel redemptive work that he's doing. And Mm, what if it's not? I get that. And yeah, I, I don't, there might be more technical definitions around heresy and heterodox, but you usually only use it if it's a big enough issue. You know, there's lots of things that we can be kind of disagreeing on wrong around, but yeah. I think significant errors in our faith for me do align around, well, I guess I go to the scripture. I, I think the scripture helps us see kind of different evaluations of how doctrines or practices when they're just like, ah, I would do it this way versus like you are destroying the church and you mm-hmm. need to <laughs> like, I mean, you'll, you can reason from that, but I do look to the scriptures to try to evaluate when, how, how to know how big differences are. I don't think it's just like, there's the big differences and then everything else doesn't matter. You know, mm-hmm. I think there's degrees of, I get that. of importance. One thing I also want to say before we progress is that these conversations, they've made me very cognizant of the stakes of the conversation in that, and I've said this to you a few times, David Frank, but if if side A is correct, that their interpretation of what Christ is doing, the Holy Spirit is doing through the scriptures, through the church, in the in reason, all those things is right then where then side b position is making the faith harder for some people in a way that's kind of like putting burdens on them but if we're right (laughs) side b perspective is right then side a the side a perspective is making actively making people's lives worse because it's drawing them from the way of the it's it's causing real spiritual harm in the church by by deceiving people into approving what is actually like harmful to mm-hmm. them in the community it makes it potentially more likely for them not to inherit the kingdom of god right like yeah. divides them moves them away from that and so and maybe you'll see this my i think my sensibility and i think your sensibility is we see ourselves as fairly rather different from side a in that regard right some side b people minimize the the contrast between us but I see, our, I see what I just said as such a notable point of contrast, indeed opposition. Mm. There's, a, there's a central disagreement on this point. To what same-sex sex, does it miss the mark or not? Mm-hmm. And does it draw people away from the living God or not? Mm-hmm. And I think your decision on that is an important one in thinking about the Christian faith because I think sex and also sexuality – it just, I think, I think they are important to the human person. I'm not saying that at the core, I'm not saying anything, 
I'm not making any of those anthropological claims as of yet, but I still see an important part. It's important. And how we express ourselves sexually is important in a life of faith following God. That's part of the reason why I think the scriptures and the tradition have talked about sex as important. Of course, it's not the only thing. If we, and we'll talk about this, I think, in the future, but economics are also a key part of the faith yeah. revelation to oh, man, how it? to live life. And we might say peacemaking, like conflict resolution, mm-hmm. another core part. There's more, the intellectual life, like the, vo- the life of vocation. There's more to say. But mm-hmm. let's not deny that sex, sexuality has been an important part of the Christian faith teaching. Because how could it not be as human beings when, you know, our sex nature is important and sex does come up in our general life, in our daily life, in our society, how we structure ourselves, all of those things. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm so cognizant from these conversations and from other conversations outside the podcast about how we, um, these are very, it's a very important topic. These conversations are important and we have a pretty fundamental disagreement as of now Mm -hmm. between ourselves and the side A or side double A sort of perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyways, let's kick off first with a little thing from JP where he reflects on kind of his experience in side X, you know, something that all the people we've interviewed and ourselves have some agreement on. I mean, there was one of the like defining features of side X for me is that you cannot, you can't say gay. You know, maybe you're not calling to pray the gay way, but you cannot use the LGBTQ terminology. That's just, that's off limits. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the things where that was, you know. Very clear. Very clear. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was this like push towards heterosexual marriage, mm-hmm. which is different than people in the, you know, side B, side Y kind of thing where it's like, well, no, you don't have to pursue marriage. But it was very much like, No, that's what you want to do. That's what you have to do. There was no, there was no idea that like singleness or celibacy had much value. Okay, man, I, I really, uh, a lot of us grew up in kind of ambiguous side X culture, you could say, you know, Mm -hmm. or that we knew that being gay was bad and, you know, you should try to change it and maybe you could pray and take it away or if you do the right things and you wouldn't be gay anymore and all those desires would go away. So it's just always interesting to hear about someone who's had more explicit experience in that and what kind of effect it had on him. Because you and I never, I, from my, what I remember of your story, you and I have never actually gone through side X counseling of any sort, right? No. Nope. Or, or therapy or whatever. No, yeah. that, okay. that's why I'm still gay, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why you're still gay. <laughs> One thing that that quote hit me was it's such a product. I'm a Protestant. I'm an Anglican, but okay, I'm in the middle somehow. But anyways, there's it showed how much how Protestant it was in that the other traditions usually had more space for singleness or celibacy, right? Like orthodoxy or Catholicism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But this this ministry was so Protestant because it was like, your human good is to marry. Yeah. And there was no space for thinking about, well, and this is also where side B comes in, but well, what about a single vocation? What about a celibate vocation? What about a specifically celibate monastic vocation? Like that wasn't on the, that wasn't even on the option list, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like you marry. <laughs> yeah. Which good news. I just came across this ministry that got started up. It's called Single Minded, a single minded dot mm-hmm. community. And it's all about helping the churches learn about what the Bible says about singleness. So it's not specifically regarding, you know, Christians who experience same sex attraction or don't experience heterosexual attraction. So it's good to see that this work is is happening in the Protestant churches finally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Finally. So JP, he then kind of moved out of side X spaces, got involved in side B spaces. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I I think it was super notable how, just how we, how we navigated this personally here. Let's take a listen to this clip. I felt it was the most honest thing to do because I had had attempts at celibate partnerships that had ended very badly. Mm -hmm. And I decided to pursue a relationship that wasn't necessarily going to be celibate. And I did not, didn't bother me whether that was going to be with a man or a woman. Mm-hmm. 
And when it ended up that I was dating a man, I did not feel like I could, with integrity, stay in the group. I think I commented it while we were recording with him, but he, I mean, he mentions it. Uh, he says he could not feel like he could, with integrity, stay in the group. And so much of his story is this deep conviction about wanting to kind of practice whatever he's preaching and mm -hmm. be within, you know, like if he says he's part of this group that holds these values, if he is part of this church that says it holds this, he wants to be consistent with that. He doesn't want to in any way be living a lie. And it brought him a lot of kind of tension, but I, I find it deeply admirable when it, it can be really easy to you know, just kind of hide behind stuff or sometimes we like, I don't know, can get caught in shame stuff where we're like, oh yeah, I'm kind of ashamed of this. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm not going to change anything. I don't know. One thing, one takeaway that I've had in my recent life, and this was JP's included in this, I've been astounded in a certain way or wondered at the fact that some side A people that I see, they seem to have a lot high level of Christian virtue in the sense that they've been, they have been earnestly seeking how to live faithfully, earnestly seeking like what, how do I, should I think about my sexuality and what that means for faith? And there's a humility in what they do. There's a dedication. There's a wrestling, I guess, earnestness, you might say. There's the, the desire for truth. All of these things, I see them pursue it. And even if they come at a different, they come to a different belief than I or us or side B, mm -hmm. I cannot help but admire it. And, it, and I actually I admire their Christian walk in some ways more than some of my general straight Christian friends who don't have to wrestle with this or wrestle as intently with what it means to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, but who more, more just take the, just take the normal way of things. Like I pray and read my Bible, which is all good. But they don't have to wrestle with what does the faith mean for me, or they don't pursue it. They, they could they could ask other questions, like what does the faith mean for me being part of this economic system or on this land or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they don't go that far. So. It's especially easy to contrast with folks who may say everything, you know, orthodox or you know, they're mm -hmm. they're affirming the traditional Christian sexual ethic but they're straight unmarried and sleeping with other people and not, not bringing that to the light, not seeking to really repent from that or, you know, get help if they need it, but still like almost taking a moral high ground. <laughs> hmm. And so in that regard, you can see like JP's yeah. in integrity to not, he never presented himself really as a, person who like he know he knew his own difficulties and his own failures and was trying to be honest about where he was at the moment rather than being kind of a living contradiction mm -hmm. but you could that seems admirable yeah like and, I, said, and i think there's such a danger in I, I think some people have been really repelled from side b or even maybe even you know other conservative fish communities mm -hmm. just because of that moralism the sense of oh we're better because we have the right theology mm -hmm. and i mean i think all sides can do that but for those who are maybe really fighting to hold an unpopular theology we can be extra guilty of of falling into that trap mm -hmm. yeah yeah i get that I want to oh, celebrate partnerships. Here, let's take a listen to this clip. JP, I'm personally really interested in extend, expanding, continuing the conversations around like celibate relationships of different sorts. Yeah. The one thing I just want to say for anyone who's out there like considering it, mm -hmm. I would strongly urge you to find one where you are not romantically attracted to the person. Okay. Because that is something as I've learned about what queer platonic partnerships are, which was a term that the side B group was finding used in like secular culture, so yep. to speak. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that those kind of relationships emphasize is that, well, they're, even if you're theoretically going to maybe have sex, like 
there can't be it has to be a bond that isn't about a romance like okay. a, yeah a rush of feelings uh, i appreciated that jp brought up the queer platonic relationships if you look that up you can find i think a new york times or maybe washington post article about it and you can just see that in the secular world there's non-christians who are also not because of moral convictions but are also looking to you know relationships where they're practicing celibacy they're not having sex with each other even though they're committed to each other in this kind of partner fashion and yeah there's just wisdom that can be learned about from from these relationships of what is really needed or what, what things might set you up for success in achieving that kind of relationship and what might be dangerous and having a rush of feelings and being really attracted might be just setting yourself up to go on a roller coaster ride rather than achieve, being a sustainable celibate partnership which he shares then later that just kind of the lack of success in these relationships that he was trying kind of discouraged him in his overall side b endeavors i don't know if that would have saved things in either case i think they were the lack of examination on the part of my partners in each case the lack of their processing of these kinds of questions mm -hmm. about you know whether it be consent or shame that was kind of doomed the relationships in both cases i um i have a lot of thoughts on this one thing that i think comes clearly is that you need to, to before you enter a solid partnership you need to enter with essentially fear and trembling i think of an anglican um i forgot the exact term but the anglican marriage liturgy and it basically says that like you must enter the marriage covenant with mm. care and discernment or fear and trembling, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact term. And in the same way, I would say you need to enter like a covenant brotherhood in the same way with fear and trembling and even a covenant brotherhood or sisterhood in a celibate partner subspecies in the same way. Like you need to discern before what this means for you, what this means for your community, what kind of commitment this is, how this will change your life. <laughs> All of these things need to be thought of. Are you at a virtuous place to do this? Are you willing to accept the unknown, that there'll be unknown in the future? You don't understand all that this will mean for you. But also you have to be open to the fact that there may be goods you never anticipated or pains you've never anticipated, right? Mm. And I, and I, that's one of the things when I hear him say that that's one of the things that immediately come to mind. I will also say I have a I have a different idea, a little bit different idea what how romance is related than what he seems to imply in the quotes that we shared. But yeah, yeah. well, and so. it, I mean that word it contains <laughs> that a lot. Word. It's, it's hard <laughs> to it, it can it holds a lot, so yeah. I, don't, I don't get too hung up on that. And he he mentions the need for communication and kind of pre-processing or examination by folks pursuing kind of intimate partnerships where they're mm -hmm. keeping celibacy. And he he's yeah, we might get into this more with Tyler because he comments on purity culture, but the just kind of not talking about our self as sexual beings and what it means to manage those experiences outside of when you're ready to quote unquote go all the way and you know have sex in marriage. These are actually still really relevant things. Like, I mean, as little as asking for permission to hold someone's hand, you know, like we're embodied beings and and we've kind of not set ourselves up well to know how to have good conversation around a lot of these things so i i really sympathize for just kind of how the odds were stacked against him and wish that there could have been more support in those initial endeavors of his i think it also shows that there's not a good enough model for how to put this together what this relationship looks like and I think a model is emerging, but it's still not widely known or not totally there. And so that's an, I think that's an ongoing project. So yeah. we shall see how it develops more. Well, JP, if you're listening, thanks again for, uh, thank you, for JP. joining with us. Yeah, um, I was so happy you would be part of our the podcast. And I hope you maybe we'll come back again and talk some more. So, so let's hear a little bit from Tyler Sitt. A lot. The reason why I find many arguments around 
side X, especially, but I think also in some, some conversations that I've had with side B folks, uh, the reason why I found that unpersuasive is because I see characteristics within these arguments that are traits of empire. And if my job is to replace the empire with the kingdom of God, then necessarily I have to be suspicious when people are replicating power systems that are used to oppress people. And I think that in particular, a, a bone to pick that New City has is with, with purity culture and with the rise of like 1990s understanding of purity culture that has left people really um, traumatized and atheist, frankly. Like it's, it's, it hasn't mm -hmm. matched people's experiences mm -hmm. of how their bodies work or how society should be. And I think the, the path to liberation is to kind of repent from the sin that we saw in purity culture for the sake of a more robust, more holistic understanding of our sexuality. So Tyler, it, w it was really fun to, to talk with him. There's sometimes where I'm like on the same beat, you know, and, and they're like, wait, I feel like you just use that word in a different way than how I, well, it's containing something. I, there's some type of disconnect that happens. Yeah, I get that too. One of the, and this will come up with Giacomo as well, but I think we mentioned this in so many ways. I find myself agreeing with Tyler. Like a lot of my Christian life, we just, again, have a similar posture of sensibility in a certain way to the what the Christian faith entails or to the world. But he is also using certain terms, certain metaphors, or drawing on certain streams, theological streams that I'm not, or that I'm using differently. For example, we both have an interest in liberation theology, but he places that at the center of his theological enterprise, right? Like it's right there. Mm -hmm. And that is, I see it as subsidiary, a subsidiary stream that's necessary, but not the main theological take or something. Mm -hmm. And I think the the danger of an over-centralized liberation theology is that, I mean, similar to the, the move towards deconstruction, it's like mm -hmm. it can have this overemphasizing on what you're always being liberated from <laughs> yeah, without a, like what you're being liberated to. And, and so even like purity culture as being something to rightfully attack, like Wesley Hill is someone who also has problems with purity culture. But at a Revoice conference, he had a, a positive talk to say, there's also the Christian virtue of purity that we yes. should be maintaining. And he elaborated on the, that from the scriptures. So that being able to do that both and of, yeah, there's this liberation motif in scriptures that draws us out of, you know, deception and slavery and oppression and, and brings justice. But part of that land of justice and righteousness includes the virtues and those are yeah. things that require discipline, which require submission and cultivating in ways that don't just have the liberative zeal per se. I mean, you are being, mm -hmm. it's still liberation from sin, but it's, it's into the practice of, of virtues. And so I w would love to see those things held together rather than it feeling like sometimes the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater. Uh-huh. Like I was surprised. It was hard for me to listen to this in a certain sense when he seems to imply that our side B position has these traits of empire. And I was kind of like, what? <laughs> because obviously in the, in the liberation theology term, the empire is like the great evil or something. And the idea is that we're replicating heteronormative oppressive systems. Which is so fun. I mean, not to say <laughs> that like Satan's empire that he's building is utmostly creative and can like really turn things on its head but uh -huh. just thinking about you know the primary where that empire motif is derived from is mm -hmm. the roman empire especially uh -huh. at the time of yes. jesus where jesus is constantly subverting roman rule but like the Romans loved pagan sexuality like <laughs> the thing that the church was introducing to subvert like pagan sexuality of all these different, you know, like temple idolaters was monogamy sure, yeah. <laughs> and celibacy. Like hundred percent. And they're like, what are these Christians doing? Like they're only taking one wife. They're 
And in fact, a lot of them are just giving up sex and marriage completely. This is completely undercutting what our like temple worship is about, how our you know systems are managed in terms of how we're you know oppressing ourselves and maintaining our power and holding up our identities in the empire and that's mapping onto their sexual relationships and it's yeah so it's a little strange to to see it now being called oppressive when it was actually it was liberative in that liberative. context right the original the christian ethic was liberative the like liberative or something because it brought so many people out from being Sex like slaves, objects, sex slaves, sex yeah, slaves, you know? making gave, people commit to each other. <laughs> it gave They're, dignity to men and women because it said fornication is wrong for both men and for women. Not just men mm, can do whatever they mm -hmm. want and women must be committed just the sexual person for one, for a man only. Yeah. It, yeah. It said children was important. It said God created man and female. Women were not just inferior men. Like, I mean, so, so much was going on. And I suppose he would say, or a possible response could be, all oh, that's true. However, they didn't understand that queer people, mm. as we now understand that there's a, certain people have a, a a pattern of common attraction for the same sex. And that wasn't understood in the same terms back then. They were, they were doing other ways of categorizing sexual desire. And so we're oppressing it, people by replicating power systems, which prevent queer people from accessing marriage. And I think we'll probably have to engage this more fully in a future episode or something, but yeah, it, it's a argument worth being engaged with. Mm -hmm. And, and I, what, what would be the argument that you think you'd use that how purity culture might be a version of that, of empire? My guess is that he would say purity culture I think, again, he would tie to heteronormativity. It just said that heteronormativity and sex has to be so nearly channeled that it does not allow certain other sexual varieties to be accessed by other people who could then achieve the liber liberation and joy inherent in that, that experience of being sexually in engaged with someone else who they love, something like that. And in his pursuit to be more holistic, that's engaging, you know, the whole sexual spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, I actually find Leah Labrisco Sargent. Mm -hmm. She's a writer of Other Feminists. And she had a review that included commenting on Bill Nye the Science Guy's new show. I don't remember what it's called. But there was an episode that he did on sexuality. And she contrasted it to... How if this was like a magic school bus, Miss Frizzle it would be going in and saying, what is the human body really engaging with a curiosity, like the whole thing of sexuality? It would be taking that magic school bus and going into the women's fallopian tubes and seeing how things are changing and blood is flowing. And like it would be looking at the wonders of the reproduction system mm. versus Bill Nye, the science guy's version ended with kind of just strange little skits and a dance number around sexual expressionism and using our sex toys basically like for fun and for whatever we wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really good to be having conversations on the experiential aspects of like, oh, I have feelings and what it, like these sexual feelings, these hormones in our bodies are not bad things. That is a part of the sexual experience. But if we reduce it down to just the feelings of sexual pleasure and thrills and connection and deny all the reproductive aspects that are connected and intertwined into that, that they're actually mm -hmm. like very inseparable, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually feel like a holistic approach. It actually feels like a very reductionist approach that's being aware that different people are likely to be enticed to different types of sexual pleasures, but... Yeah, I would yeah. have a bone to pick with. Uh, I would be pushing for a holistic understanding of our sexuality that kind of submits to our bodies a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sure, I get that. Again, you guys should check out Leia Labresco Sargent. She's really great. And she hits on just so much how a true like equality for women actually means 
making systems and tools that particularly when it comes to mothering, uh, let me see example I was reading about. She mentions how we create the even more convenient and efficient breast pumps so that, you know, working moms can quickly go into a closet, pump away to relieve, you know, like their breast milk pressure and then get back to work. And we can pretend as if like they're not really lactating at all. And <laughs> it's, it's, you know, using tools almost to like make them as close to a man as possible and make the reality of the fact that they are a mother of a newborn infant and that mm -hmm. this has like biological interdependency that we cannot ignore. And if that child were actually there in the workplace, you would not be able to ignore the cries of the baby and that, they, you know, like that mm -hmm. nursing needs to happen and that the mothers and babies' bodies are actually like in this intertwined, like responsive relationship. And that's just a very different reality. Not to say that I don't think Tyler Sitt would disagree with me on that of wanting to empower moms in the workplace, but I've found it to be a more consistent kind of vision of the liberation that Jesus is doing is, is not to be as efficient in the workplace and to be as easily accessible, accessing our bodily pleasures, but it's actually embracing the created order in all its fullness and beauty and, mm. and living into a vision that transcends our individual autonomy, which includes relationships where we belong to each other, not by choice, but by design. Mm -hmm. um, That's beautiful. Thank you. I think it also shows that we disagree with Tyler on the very basic points of what the created order is trying to do, what oppression is, and what brokenness might be, right? And I think part of that is our differences between us not forefronting liberation theology as the chief frame for our theological endeavor, but having it as part of the system, but not the, the chief part of the system, which is how I see him. I, I, I don't think he disagree necessarily, but maybe he would. Yeah. So, yeah. Should we go on the next Tyler quote? Yep. I think that it's just <laughs> kind of like a, a matter of discerning what exactly the cross that we are to bear is. Mm -hmm. And I think that the evidence of us having discerned well is when we are able to grow in love of God, neighbor, and self. And mm -hmm. the evidence of us discerning not well is when we isolate from God, neighbor, and self. And mm -hmm. from my perspective, I see so much overwhelming evidence that um, LGBTQ affirmation is going to lead to more love of God, neighbor, and self than otherwise. And so mm. that's ethically important to me, like that folks from a spiritual, social, and personal perspective can approach that. And I think that the reason why this is important is because when I am in community with folks who have a different sexual ethic than I do, like if they're side X or side B, I hear a lot of preoccupation with understanding sexuality and really like trying to discern like, can I do this or can I do that? Or like, does this mm. count or does that count? Or does this word or does that word? And it's like kind of like an all-consuming thing for, for some of the folks that I've been in community with where it's like, I'm just kind of constantly figuring out like, is it okay for me to look at that person in that way? Is it okay for me to have this thought? Is it okay for me to have this article? And, and when folks start living out their sexuality in the form of dating or, or connecting with people romantically, a lot of that preoccupation goes down and they're mm -hmm. able to kind of like create spaciousness for other things in their life. And the, the other, you know, all the other functions of the body that act similarly are like base functions for survival. So like, if, you, if we are starving, we won't be able to think of anything but food until we have food. Or if we're <laughs> thirsty, then we're not going to be able to think about anything until we have water. Okay. So I selected this quote specifically because it's been on my heart since we talked with Tyler. It, this has been the quote that has sort of been, I don't say a burden maybe to me, or it's been the one that resonates or reverberates through my mind like, often. And I, and yeah, and I've been wrestling with this in particular. And the particular thing is like 
for some people who are trying to be side B, trying to be celibate, trying to discern this thing, they have to ask all these questions and they have to just wrestle with it so much that it, it like takes their time and their energy. Like it takes it away just to be focused on this, this huge, seemingly huge to them issue or topic or problem. And then that kind of preoccupies them from the other parts of their vocation. And Tyler's saying when people start living out their sexuality or connecting with people romantically, that preoccupation goes down and creates new spaciousness in their life for the other parts of their vocation to be forefronted. And I've been struggling with this for the past year because I so much feel like I have to put so much of my know, mental energy, emotional energy, physical energy in trying to follow the sexual ethic that I understand to be what God wants for people. And that means that other parts of my life kind of suffer because I have to wrestle with or lay out this energy, this time, this whatever, to try to walk in accord. There's more to say. on It does assume in a certain way that he talks about if you're thirsty, then we're not going to be able to do anything until we have water. So it assumes that sexual, that sexual expression is a need, like water or food or something, which is, I would not necessarily say that, but I, there's still a tension nonetheless. So there's a tricky thing about the human heart and there's a time it can, we can spend a lot of energy, you know, resisting or guarding or trying to channel around these longings that we have. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we get them, it doesn't, <laughs> it's not quite just like the experience of like, oh, I'm thirsty. I got water. Now I can go on with my day. It's like, oh, now I'm involved in this like complicated relationship or I just got you know, I really wanted this job and now this is like a really weird workplace and, mm. and, it, and, and new things come about. So it's easy to have the kind of grass is always greener on the other side, but it, there's a lot of different ways that our heart can be entangled. And so I totally, there, we can easily get preoccupied and distracted and I don't want to needlessly put barriers in front of people. And I, and I think it's difficult. I mean, especially like purity culture that like blocks off sometimes for st especially straight people, like cross gender relationships, they're all like freaked out about. And it's like, mm -hmm. we just need to put some time into practicing some like brotherhood and sister relationships. And maybe this can actually decrease the tensions here and like give us some breathing room. <laughs> like, I think every situation is different in terms of there might be some levers that we can pull to, to take down the pressure. But I don't mm. think every longing is simply comparable to, yeah, as you said, like, just meet it. And yeah, I, I, I sympathize. But I actually think if we, Giacomo's first quote kind of pairs with a little bit as a response. So Tyler, if you're listening, and if there's anything that we misrepresented you, let us know and we can edit the podcast retroactively. But we, yeah, hope we get to have more dialogue in the future. So I think the sexual project of Orthodox Christians is, in my mind, predicated on the idea that the human eros is created in the image and likeness of divine eros. Now, if, if Western Christians balk at the idea of divine eros, it's all over the Greek fathers mm -hmm. that God loves us erotically, we love God erotically, and the three persons of the Holy Trinity love one another erotically. Unfortunately, what a lot of postmodern Christians want to make of that is to sexualize God. And I will go on record as, as, as absolutely and vehemently rejecting any sexualization of God. The reason I think that this, these words from Giacomo connect well with what Tyler Sitt was talking about is that just our, this eros is the, is the word that we put to it. One of the Greek words for love, that's kind of this passion and... It's not a passion. Sorry. Okay. Not a passion in the technical sense. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's like, but it's, that, like... it's that passionate drawn into beauty, I mean, yeah. kind of love, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. And... Yes. These things like 
they're just so tied up with each other that I, I think that they have to be constantly in dialogue. This is for single people and for married people that like our, our, if you're married, even your, your spouse is never going to be the fulfillment of all really your sexual longings because sexual longings are never disconnected from this greater picture of Eros and us trying to be drawn into the communion with God. And so when we're practically struggling with it, I don't know, I just wrestle with how we, there's a part that I know that God always has more for us. And, and, and there's a, sometimes when we're hitting a wall, it's, it's a God placed wall that's asking us to break through into maybe through a dark night of the soul uh, into, into some new depth of relationship where we're getting more raw with him. I see that, but I still, I still struggle to have that answering what Tyler said was saying. Cause if the answer is mostly that I need to just keep moving, keep progressing in a spiritual journey with, to come closer to God, to become more like God, that seems generally right. Right. Obviously, that's a good, that's a, that's my Christian call. That's one of my Christian calls, probably the chief one. But I, I still have to struggle with this idea that a lot of parts of me, <laughs> a lot of fibers in my being, parts of my mind, my thoughts, whatever, I think that I could do that better if I were to have maybe a side A type relationship, right? Now, and a lot of straight people who are on the same pursuit of God, they do that. They find another man, another woman, right? What man or woman? I'll use opposite sex, and that's how, and that's still an important part of their Christian life, as a a comforter in a certain sense, a helpmate, like a fellow journeyer on the path. And we can talk about how, of course, marriage has been an economic exchange. We can talk about dying off of covenant brotherhood, sisterhood, dying off of other kinships. We can talk about all those things, but it still doesn't change that I desire this. Does that make sense? It seems like it's a positive benefit for me. You're saying and, in, in how it just feels like it would be good for you, even though yes, your current like, convictions are like, oh, it doesn't check out. It doesn't align. Yes. And I'm, I'd am i love a celibate partnership and like that. I'd be interested in that. But I still see, I still see there's a pain of the aestheticism for me. But again, the tension of the Tyler said thing still sits, weighs on me. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, well, yeah, let's just loop in this other quote from Giacomo. From Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople in our own day, back to Father Pavel Florensky a hundred years ago, that orthodoxy is not moralistic. That, that moralism is, is a foreign category in in. Orthodox life, Orthodox spirituality and theology. Now, this doesn't mean the opposite of moralism isn't immorality. Mm -hmm. The opposite of moralism is asceticism. Mm -hmm. You know, in my experience, the moral judge other people and the ascetic judges only himself. What I really appreciate about this idea of the ascetic in, in this kind mm -hmm. of broader way is it is the humility that it helps gear people towards in a culture or maybe just our own predispositions to be more focused often at doing the moral boundary keeping around us while letting, you know, as Jesus says, pointing out the speck in another's eye while not recognizing the log in our own eye. Mm -hmm. It just kind of hits there. And that call to, you know, prior to it, it doesn't make sense for me to be being f quick to, you know, poke fingers at TJ's tension that he's feeling where, I mean, and he's, he's holding it faithfully and submitting himself to, to his trust in what God is teaching and what, the church has been maintaining for faithfulness with his body. But even in, in his tensions, it'd be wrong for me to, to cast a, an aspersion <laughs> upon him when I have plenty that I can 
be in a sense judging myself and be assessing in myself and saying, oh, where do I have weaknesses and longings that I need God's aid in, that I need guidance in? And and so I appreciate that kind of correction to moralistic tendencies. Mm-hmm. I also, I've been following an Orthodox prayer rule, or sorry, fasting rule for several years. And I often appreciate this kind of idea that in fasting, keep your eyes on your own plate, meaning like focus on your own fasting rule, not just how your neighbor or brother or sister <laughs> is not fasting. Like they're not giving up enough, whatever. They're not, they're eating meat on this day or they're drinking dairy on this day or whatever. And I see something there. And I think this is so valuable. And I also think the repentant sinner, like the tax collector who's repentant mm-hmm. before God is the one who's justified, not the wealthy man who's like, hey, like, God, you know, I do X, Y, Z. I do all these things. I give the money to the poor. I do whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One tension I feel, though, with this quote we just listened to is, I think it can, if you take this too far, it undercuts sort of the doctrinal and prophetic witness of the church to try to teach the 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 true faith, like the way of God to the people, God, God's people and to the whole creation so they can be reconciled to God. Yeah. Yeah. It would be silly to, to move from this into a individualistic <laughs> type mm-hmm. of way of operating the church where like, basically it says you do you, you know, that's yeah, definitely not what Giacomo supports, which is why I so, I find him the most intriguing in some ways because mm-hmm. he's very non-traditional side A in that mm-hmm. He's like, theologically speaking, marriage is like defined as the covenantal sexual relationship between husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And we do not have the permission to redefine marriage. And also Mm he holds that promiscuity is not allowable, even if he might, I think he'd hold a repentant posture towards the ways that he engaged in, I think, promiscuity in the past. Mm-hmm. But he he doesn't encourage that, and he he pushes back against people who use their sexual orientation as a justification for being promiscuous. So he's trying to create basically a new type of relationship of a mm-hmm. a different type of sexual covenant committed relationship between yes. the same sex, and Correct. I think also still monogamous. Yeah, he was so, strong on that. He was strong on the monogamous point. He's not. He's definitely side A. He's not pro poly, poly, like polygamy, polygyny, polyamory. So he he holds this very strong view of marriage, strong view of mm-hmm. church tradition. But I think he says that he sees this as a part of. I think similar as you were saying to maybe Tyler's reasoning on like why heteronormativity is oppressive is that it doesn't recognize that part of the human experience is the sexual diversity. And so mm-hmm. we can't stop that. So it's it's kind of recognizing that if you have same-sex attraction, even if you're bisexually attracted, Giacomo would say, you still have to still have to pick of who you're going to be monogamous with. Yeah. But there's space to find that intimacy sexually outside of the procreative. For me, Giacomo Giacomo represents the most possibly persuasive side A account though from the ones we listen to. I think you'd say the same. It, because it, it, the fact that it holds up marriage and is not trying to reinterpret it, but is trying to do something new, makes it much more plausible for me. Yeah, it's kind. Of, this is how I read it, what he's saying is we've learned more about sexual diversity, as you mentioned. And that makes us realize some people are like this. But though pastoral... that reasoning I find completely semi ludicrous. Wait, 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 maybe, but let me let me finish. So we learn more for about sexual diversity about people. And then in our contemporary world, we need to make an adaption to it, and that's a pastoral accommodation. And that produces a new not marriage, but a type of I don't know if he has a term for it, but a type of relationship, which is two people of the same sex or sexual can be sexually involved together in a monogamous relationship. And I guess he, t- he ties that to Florensky. Some, I don't remember what Florensky's ca- title category was, but a type of friendship, right? I don't remember what he said exactly. Yeah. It's a form of brotherly but, love. Yeah. A form of brotherly love. Uh-huh. 
And this is not it's not celibate, not a celibate partnership, not a covenant brotherhood, which is celibate, but it's again a sexually involved friendship for people of the same sex. And the reason I reacted so strongly is because of this like, oh, all of a sudden in the 20th century, we learned this brand new thing about being humans. It's just that I, there's writings from in Plato's Symposium. Okay, what? How old is that, TJ? Yeah, a few thousand well, years old. I don't remember. It's, yeah, it's thousands of years old. I don't remember. You know, exactly. it predates yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And it talks about men, a certain type of men who only like sexual relationships with other men and are mm-hmm. so disposed unto this that they would be happy for the craftsman god Hephaestus to unite them in one body. Like, mm-hmm. maybe you can say that this was still like lost in certain cultures or society or not, you know, but it's definitely not new. It's definitely not an idea that Paul, the apostle, may not have come across because he definitely saw same sex, probably monogamous relationships in his day, or at least knew about them in the larger Roman society. So I know that's contested, but I would, my understanding of the evidence is the same. I, I guess it existed previously. Yeah, there's. I th- but I think I think the I think the argument is I think Giacomo might say, is that now we see it. We've learned that it's an enduring pattern in a stronger sense, because also at the same time in like Greco-Roman society, oftentimes these male head of households were engaging with both. You know. Yeah, most of them were, but they yeah. they noticed a, a type that didn't that had enduring same sex partnerships sure. as this kind of oddity. Maybe and, it became obscured subsequently in the West, in the in the Christian East. I don't know. Just speculation. So I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I I find his solution most plausible because of mm-hmm. what it holds on to. But as you try to roll that out in the implications, it just doesn't really it feels very predisposed on I mean your reasoning there of oh well there's this patterns of enduring things. What does that mean for bisexual people? Do they have to take the heteronormative route? Why do they get the exception that was created for the gay people? You know, the ones mm-hmm. who are super gay. Yeah. And, well, and in Giacomo's, means, they still have to choose. Yeah, they, they, just, they have they to have choose options. monogamy. But yeah. this, you know, new exception and accommodation is actually now this like broad spectrum playing field that's not actually an accommodation for, I don't know. It, it doesn't feel... I'm more sympathetic, I think, in the sense of what he's trying to argue, because I think it would be an accommodation because it would say queer people would no longer, celibacy is not the the main option they have, or marriage to the opposite sex, which they may not be quite, be disposed to, essentially. I think the or other reason that polygamy I'm... Polygamy or polygyny. So both, both for Tyler and Giacomo, what mm-hmm. I, what makes me so hesitant from kind of... I don't know the words. It makes me very hesitant to to buy into it. Mm-hmm. Is how much it it seems to downplay singleness and further idolize romance in our society. We're just such a sex mm-hmm. and romance centered society, and so True. it just feels like mm-hmm. we're pulling every card we can to try to like help everybody worship it in a similar way that our society worships mammon, worships financial wealth. It's like, oh well. That seems like you're trying to help them, but actually it's just shoving them towards your same idol. Yeah, I can understand that. Mm-hmm. So that, that, is, that I think that gives me a, a huge hesitancy when it, the, the I don't mm-hmm. feel like our reasoning can be trusted until our idolatries are are displaced. I think that's a critique worth 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 using and worth talking about. You can, I think that's right. You can still understand it though at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think even for us who have that critique, it doesn't mean that sex and sex and whatever we, we categorize as romance, quote unquote, are not desirable still. And of course, we're shaped by our cultural context. Just if we're in, in the U.S., for example, to find them more desirable. But we're also heirs of the Western traditions, for example, Protestant like Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. You know what I mean? We're, we're heirs of a larger, it's like this whole this whole movement that's elevates romance. And we talked about that in Catherine's episode. And there, But we also, in Catherine's episode, even though I'm probably more critical of companion marriage in most ways, we just talked about there were goods to that. 
right? Like we can yep. see it and we think there's certain goods to it nonetheless. So I'm just trying was, to build more companionship without it having to be under marriage. <laughs> you might, yeah, I know. Which Giacomo is too, in a certain way. We're just, <laughs> in a certain way. Yeah, we just, <laughs> we're quite we're skeptical of some of those ways. So, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know if I have really more thoughts. I think it's important that Christians are able to learn to speak across difference. Mm -hmm. um, that we maintain. Especially people who are also claim the name of Christ. Yes. So. Yes, mm -hmm. especially then. And that we're able to practice respect and really try to think through the other positions. And as you've heard us process, there's certain things that we're, we're more pulled by, hit our mm -hmm. hearts, hit our minds, but still... I, I I would offer all my brothers caution that JP, I guess I would offer if like differently of because if, if you're at the place of agnosticism, I'm not wanting to keep Christian morality as a barrier. I want to say, be interested in who Jesus is and see what he sparks. Then towards my brothers, Giacomo and Tyler, I would say, look again at Jesus's words. And I I really think that they are leading us in a way that is is beautiful and mm -hmm. and that these distortions that you are proposing and proclaiming sometimes are actually really dangerous to the church and are at odds with god and and so as my brother i want to say like heed the warnings of christ and 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 please point out any things that you see in my life or in my church that we need to be repenting of and turning from so that we're not coming under other other things that are worth caution and warning. Hmm. That's helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think my final thoughts are, I've said many of my kind of key takeaways earlier in the episode, but I'm also, I'm entering a point, a next chapter in life, I'm going to start engaging more side A writings so I can really understand the difference between side B and side A why they're choosing these positions, why are we choosing our positions? And I uh, and I see I see I'm pretty firmly side B. But again, I feel this I feel the stakes are so high in the decision that we make for what we're teaching and proclaiming in a certain sense. So I'm actually engaging more in I'm going to the QCF conference at, as of now in a couple in like a week, but a couple of days. Which will be in the past by the time this gets recorded. So. But and this maybe you'll have some things well. to share from that. Um, maybe I will. <laughs> and yeah, and especially to our wonderful Patreons who are supporting this podcast, please give input on yeah what questions to have these interviews left you with, and mm -hmm. or what are things that you think we need to elaborate on and dig into. Yeah, if you want to keep supporting our podcast, check out our Patreon, as David has alluded to. Also, we're just generally interested if you are a listener, like send us comments at our email, yeah. send us comments on our social media, whatever might make sense to you. Thanks so much for listening. Bye, guys. Adios. Hey, listeners. I want to let you know about the Communion and Shalom Patreon. Joining the Patreon community not only supports this podcast, but gives you the opportunity to listen to bonus content, give input on future episodes, and submit questions for a patron-only Q&A. We're so thankful for the support and encouragement from so many listeners, and we hope that this podcast continues to be meaningful to you.